up on stage, we have Brad or Dob from Superbus, um, and he's going to tell us a little bit about Black Friday. Thanks. Sorry, does anyone know IT? Awkward. <laughs> Password one, eh? Uh, okay, can everyone hear? Is this good? Do I need to lean in? Lean in. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about Black Friday, but I'm actually going to talk about stuff before Black Friday more than Black Friday. Um, yeah, so I'm from spublis.com, I'm the CTO. Um, there's me on Slack, uh, Dob CTO, so whenever people want to mark something as a very Dob CTO, they use that, it's not always great. Um, so Superbalist, for anyone who doesn't know, um, we're the equivalent of the UK's ASOS. We, we're targeting a young um, kind of market for fashionable people like all of you. Um, and <laughs> no, I, I accidentally got into fashion. Um, the, I started at the company three years ago now, um, and it's been a, a, a great kind of growth enterprise, and that's the far more interesting part of it than the fact that we're retailing clothes. That's kind of an interesting problem to solve, but uh, the fact that we're scaling so quickly is the real problem that I'm interested in. Um, so what is Black Friday? Uh, in case anyone doesn't know what Black Friday is. Does everyone know what Black Friday is? OK. Well, I'm going to tell you anyway um, from our perspective. So it's this annual event that happens. Um, this was our kind of sale theme this year, uh, biggest, biggest fashion sale in 2017. Um, but what it boils down to and, and what we've seen uh, is over the last couple of years, all these different retailers are kind of marketing to Black Friday. It's very much a US concept that came here probably five years ago, it sort of started. Um, and <clears throat> the, net, the network effect of everybody else marketing Black Friday is for everyone, Black Friday gets bigger every year um, because customers are primed to buy. Um, so we, we'll run specials on Black Friday. Some, I mean, we, we do have quite extensive specials in a lot of spaces, but we can run stuff quite similar to promos that we'd run in a normal month, and people are just there to buy. They're ready for a special, they're primed, they, they're keen. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, in terms of uh, growth over the years, so uh, the, this is our kind of on Black Friday, um, millions of page views um, on the actual day. So we kind of grow at about 2x every year, um, except this graph is just Google Analytics, so it's only web traffic. Um, the graph actually looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, because in, towards the end of 2015, we added uh, native mobile clients. And now in 2016, there was sort of about 40% of our traffic. And in 2017, there was 60% of our traffic. So that, it's a big graph. Um, so the point is that it's, it's kind of in the exponential growth territory. Uh, and the great thing is we're part of the big take a lot group. So we kind of have um, take a lot who's kind of uh, probably about three years ahead of us. We're reaching the kind of size of Kalahari uh, when Take a Lot and Kalahari got together and made an ugly baby. Um, and, and so the, the great thing from our perspective is we kind of have this big brother who's, who, like, you can look at their graphs and go, OK, well, that's us in a few years' time, or that was us then. Um, and it's, it's nice, but it's also really scary. Uh, we had a sort of all hands this year before Black Friday, and uh, the the graph was put up and it was kind of like, that was last year, and I was, I was like, okay, so next year's a really big year. Like, the, the number just gets insanely big. So this is Google search trends, just to kind of put it into perspective. Um, I don't know if anyone can see where Black Friday is on that graph. Um, <laughs> it's, it's sort of obvious. Um, and, and the big thing this year, which was quite cool, is we we were more popular than Facebook for like half a day. <laughs> 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 so 
So this is just a week view from that week. Um, the blue line, for anyone who can't see, is take a lot. The yellow line, which you can't really see, is Superblist. And everyone was slightly less interested in Facebook and slightly more interested in us. Um, so take that, Facebook. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, it's just a bit of perspective. So, so we kind of, uh, as a wider business, we the biggest e-commerce companies in South Africa, um, and it's a, a great position to be in because it's a great technical challenge. Um, that's also a great graph. I found it in one of our screenshots. It's just like a sort of random noise of what our CPUs look like on the day. Um, I, can't, I don't even know how many servers this is. It's kind of just a wild mess, but it's a bit of great art, I think. Um, but yeah, so, so in essence, on a single day, we have roughly 10 times the traffic, 10 times the payments, 10 times the deliveries, and 10 times the problems. Um, and we have to deal with all of that. Uh, and hopefully we deal with it with grace. Uh, the, the great thing is that this is a very predictable event. We know when it's going to happen. Um, it's pretty much when we say it's going to happen. Um, and we roughly know how big it is. Uh, it's, it's kind of surprising in moments, but it's anywhere between two and three times whatever last year's one was, and it's about 10 times whatever a sort of vigorous day is normally. Um, so it's an interesting tech problem, because uh, we've, we've got time to prepare for it, and, and we can kind of get ready. But basically, it's an anomaly. Um, but it's a predictable anomaly, which is really cool. So I have grown to love Black Friday, um, a lot like you love the bomb, um, because what it does is every year it kind of normalizes completely insane things for our infrastructure. Um, that, that before we kind of lost our web socket, fell over because there was too many people connected to it, um, was 34,000 concurrent connections, as in 34,000 people were browsing the site at the same time. Um, and I think there's another photo that we have of this, but, and, and I've blanked out some of the stuff, but um, there was sort of in the, in the region of like 30,000 requests per minute um, on our infrastructure, um, like uh, 500 requests a second, um, which was quite cool. Uh, it's, it's quite a lot of traffic, and it was quite an interesting problem to deal with. Um, we had a bit of a wobble as we sort of hit midnight um, of black of the day before, so uh, the Thursday evening, midnight roll around, and um, the entire site fell over. So we'd provisioned about double the capacity we normally need. Oh, sorry, um, we provisioned about double the capacity we normally need for this. And um, as midnight rolled around, uh, we actually kind of bumped our heads up against an interesting problem, which is we have varnish front ends in front of everything, um, and we use Kubernetes to manage everything, and we. We have uh, Varnish spec to have 256 meg of RAM, and we've got two Varnishes. Um, and <clears throat> until that point, we'd never basically broken out of needing that much cache and that much memory to manage connections. So Varnish kind of freaked out. Well, Varnish was actually fine. It was, it was very happy, um, except Kubernetes, we'd set request limits on those pods uh, in case. And so Kubernetes sort of said, hey, you've broken out of your memory limits and shot them in the head. And then a new one would come up and be like, I'm ready for action, I'm ready. And then it <laughs> um, so, so that was quite fun. Um, and, and kind of, so we had this flood of people kind of trashing our site. So this was when we actually got the site under control. We sort of could see there was about 35,000 people on. Um, but at about midnight, I don't really know how many people actually were on the site. I think people were trying to get in there just before everything else, but it's our biggest amount of traffic during the whole day. So the rest of the day was kind of a no sweat problem, which is an interesting one because I'd kind of stayed up until midnight and then this all happened. It took us about 30, 40 minutes to get everything under control and then we were dealing with the traffic just fine if there was a couple of creaky places. And, um, and then yeah, so then we carried on for the rest of the day. And after you've had this high watermark set from midnight, the rest of the day is kind of fine, because you're like, well, it's not crazy anymore. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to go back a couple of years now and talk 
a lot more about kind of how we got to this point of being able to deal with this traffic of this year. And I still don't think we, we're at the point of kind of dealing with an uncomfortable amount of traffic. It's an interesting amount of traffic in South Africa's context, um, but it's certainly not crazy. Um, it's not Facebook or Instagram or whatever. And I don't have any animations in this at all, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Dom's a better guy than me. Okay, so we're going to look at 2015 um, and, and where we were at as a company. Um, so this is the dev team uh, at the top. Uh, the kitty cats are the developers. Um, the grinning gro like people are um, mobile developers. So we kind of, in 2015, we'd started development on our mobile apps. Um, but basically, the team was uh, four, four kind of back-end web uh, developers and two mobile developers who are building an unreleased app. Um, the cactus in this picture obviously is a hardware load balancer, so we were hosting with Rackspace, um, kind of had a very simple setup of two web servers um, behind a hardware load balancer and um, a database server and then a kind of server that was the failover for the database. Um, and it was all automatic failover and so on, uh, but we also sort of used it to run worker, worker processes and, and cron jobs and stuff like that. So kind of quite a small little piece of infrastructure to deal with, with everything going on. Um, and these were the kind of technologies we're using. Uh, the little floating thing is Varnish. Um, I hope everyone's familiar with Varnish. It's one of my favorite pieces of technology. Um, it, uh, it deals with load in an incredible manner, like you can just keep throwing traffic at it and it doesn't really break a sweat. Yeah, so Laravel, Nginx, um, New Relic has kind of been with us on the whole journey um, and is a tool that I, I'll endorse uh, gladly. There's obviously ways that you can kind of work around a New Relic or build your own um, there's other products. Um, I've just really enjoyed it as a product. It's given us incredible insight into our application stack um, for not a huge amount of effort. I have my bugbears with them, especially around containerization and how well they work, but on the whole, it's, it's quite a cool thing. The bunnies are memcache, and we are using HipChat and Pingdom. Um, so an overriding theme, which I'll touch on later, uh, I really believe strongly in using other people's things um, and kind of leveraging other people's things as much as possible. I don't like building software myself. Um, the more code you're writing, the I think you, you, you're failing to solve problems if you're spending lots of time writing code. You should be spending time solving problems, not, not writing code. That may be contentious. Anyway, so 2015 um, was Git pull-ups, uh, as in when you wanted to do a deploy to production, you went onto the production servers and you did a Git pull, um, and it was, it was wonderful, um, and the site sort of creaked a little bit for a second as everything pulled and whatever. Um, and then we kicked some things and whatever, but it was, it was kind of okay. It wasn't, it wasn't great, but I'm sure a lot of people have kind of experienced this, this uh, production environment. Um, and in terms of the team, everyone was kind of doing everything. Um, there, there was, uh, you know, we didn't have a sysadmin. It was kind of everyone has is, is got to do a little bits and bobs. Um, Everyone's writing code, everyone's making sure servers are running, everyone's keeping monitoring and whatever. Um, and when projects come along, there's no kind of differentiation. It's just kind of who's available, who can do this. Um, so very much just like a all over the place. But we're, we're holding the shop together and kind of doing incredible things. Um, at that point, we were part of Take A Lot and we we're kind of growing nicely and, and doing reasonably well. Um, but in that year, so I joined 2015. Um, the first kind of pieces that we started doing was to shift to Google Cloud Platform, um, which I give a resounding thumbs up, Felipe, thanks. Um, and initially we were just using basically Compute Engine and Cloud Storage. Uh, we kind of built our own ramshackle service, uh, service layer or, or kind of sharing information using etcetera-d and conf-d. Has anyone used etcetera-d, conf-d? No, yeah, okay. It's really cool. <laughs> um, so it just makes it easy to have uh, distribute like config data between things. So as I say, we kind of had built our own way of having multiple servers and having ways to share uh, information between those servers. 
And conf D is really cool because you give it a template and say, look for these keys in etc. D, and if any of them ever change, then run the process again and regenerate your config and write it. So say you wanted to change a database password, you would write to etc. D, it would conf D would pick that up and then it would rewrite the configs and, and restart my SQL. You could put um, things on it. Um, we rolled in Sentry as well, because prior to that it was kind of like look at logs and errors and, and try to figure out what went wrong. Um, has everyone seen Sentry or used Sentry before? Anyone? Yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, Airbrake, Sentry, any of them. It's basically exception logging and it will change your life if you haven't ever used something like that, uh, because in production you can get really granular detail into what went wrong and what the data looked like at the time, as well as call stacks that kind of give you real solid insight into going, oh, that thing went wrong because this data looked really wonky at that point. Um, and we, we started using Flask, so uh, we built a, a BFF layer, which I'll talk about now, I think, if I know how my slides work. Um, we built a BFF layer in Flask, so it was a stateless uh, web service that talked to all our internal services and um, basically marshaled stuff around, but provided a consistent interface for our mobile clients as they were released. And we rolled out Thumbo, um, which I think you can say in a really vigorous manner of Thumbo! So I really love it. It's a great little piece of technology. You basically can craft URLs and say, like, I want this image at 300 by 300, or I want to crop it in this way. Or you can write your own custom plugins. Um, so anyone who's done resizing and so on, it's a great tool, because you can also put it behind a CDN, and then you can CDN the shit out of any images that you want served, and your front end can make a decision about what size images it actually wants on a page. Um, so. In moving to Google Cloud, uh, we moved to what I call sticky tape bash ops. Um, I, I'm kind of, uh, I don't particularly love uh, the complexity that things like Chef and Puppet and Ansible sort of tolerable, but I, I don't like how much um, kind of uh, complexity some of those things bring. And, and at the time, we we're a very small lean team, and now you're kind of going, and I've tried it before, I've tried to kind of take a team and, and learn Puppet and Chef and, and try to roll that out and you, you're suddenly spending your time that one person in the team has to learn Chef and Puppet and becomes the Chef and Puppet expert. Um, everyone knew Bash and one of the things which I've loved about the Google platform is the command line tools that come with Google are incredible and you can do things like scaling, you can do deployments, you can do all sorts of shit just with a little bit of Bash. Um, so how that looked like in our world is we just, I don't know if everyone can see that, um, it's basically just a bunch of bash scripts, like create environments and create firewall rules, et cetera, et cetera. And pretty much all of that is just shell scripts calling Google Compute's uh, gcloud command. Um, so as I say, I, I, I love it. It's great. It's simple. And Google kind of does a bunch of the orchestration. Um, and we started getting into this kind of mentality of machines are things that you can kind of rebuild from scratch. We weren't quite there. but. But you, shouldn't, you should treat a machine as something that a new one could spin up or you can shoot one in the head and you don't worry that that thing goes away. Um, so yeah, so we were kind of at the point that we were instantly scalable. Um, and, and all the other kind of C-suite people were like, so, you know, we're cloudy and we can scale. And I was like, yeah, it's great. Um, but the truth is, like, it, it, it did mean that we could kind of you know, relatively easy in a couple of minutes, uh, bring up an instance and put it into rotation and kind of have a scaling group. Uh, and it meant that for now, we, we'd kind of put plasters over the bleed of, of when we need more servers or if there's going to be more traffic tomorrow, we can kind of do that. Um, but we're not quite at the kind of point where we're just going, uh, whiz bang, it just grows and grows as you need and it's perfectly amazing. Um, so yeah, so we didn't, we were kind of taking baby steps towards it. And as I say, Google Cloud Platform meant a lot of that was very easy. And compared to Rackspace, where you kind of order a server, and then they provision it for you, and you're like, hey, is it ready? And hey, this isn't working right. None of those problems. We've got full control, um, which I'm sure everyone recognizes. So 1st of September, we launched our first mobile apps. Um, and that meant. Uh, this new kind of dynamic. Uh, historically, the company had been just a website, and now you're adding 
two mobile apps at the same time, um, and it's where we went for the backends for frontends pattern. Um, I don't know if everyone has heard of this concept. It's not rocket science. It's basically just going, you, you write a backend that your frontends will talk to, I know. And, uh, and basically, that thing knows how to talk to all your internal services, and it knows how to translate things and do whatever. And your front ends can keep a consistent version. Um, and because you're kind of writing this isolated piece of code, it's stateless. Uh, well, it, you should aim to be stateless or mostly stateless, like we run a memcache uh, with it. But the concept is that that thing can maintain an API. So. How that's been very powerful for us is we had this legacy kind of uh, monolithic API, and we pulled search out of it, and then search was a new service, and for a while we could still do searches on the old API, but now we needed to move to this new API, and it had a slightly different format and so on. The mobile API could keep running, and as we switched over to the new search service, it could figure out how to translate into producing a consistent thing for those mobile clients, which are in the wild, they're very difficult to update. So cool, we can just go, well, there's the front end, and we can version that API and so on. Um, and it's a very powerful pattern. It's the same way that I'm thinking more about web front ends as well now. When you get into the single um, page application territory, it's exactly the same pattern. Um, so our first uh, uh, Black Friday that I took part in, um, was the 27th of November, and we gave away a million rand in discounts. Um, so that meant that, you know, from our perspective, we made X amount of money, and we basically said to customers, well, we're giving a million rand away, and when it runs out, you don't get any more. Um, so this was uh, actually on the site, so that's at 9.30 a.m. Um, people had spent about 325, uh, 329 million uh, 329,000 rand of our promo, um, but we just had this ticker that was kind of going down. Um, and then at the same time, internally, we built a little Slack bot that just kind of like, as the number ticked along, it would just say, oh, we've spent this much, and oh, we've spent this much. So we could kind of keep an eye on it. Um, we eventually did spend it all, I think, into the evening, but it, it kind of was, um, we were out and drunk and kind of that. I think I might have been drunk then. <laughs> Um, it was a very long day. So, yeah, so, so all in, like, it was a successful day. Um, and from the, the actual back end's perspective, we kind of um, started seeing some of these interesting pieces of traffic. Uh, that's just one of our web servers. I think at the time we had three or so, three or four. Um, and, I mean, it's nothing crazy. It's four megabytes per second of traffic. Um, I don't know why it's outgoing and ingoing. You probably can't see it anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, so it was a reasonable amount of traffic. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. So that was incoming traffic into our varnish uh, uh, load balancers. And having New Relic and having all these various pieces where we can see, you can kind of see the benefit of varnish. Um, we, we kind of, uh, we bank on about, so we have some parts, some of our API calls are real time and you kind of expect that they, they're always going to fall through to back end, but we sit at sort of like 45% um, of cache hits. So customers are getting cached pages, um, which, yeah, meant about sort of, it, it got up to about 60, 60 requests a second onto our back end. But then our back end's back end was kind of quite chilled, um, probably about half of that. But the cooler one was we deployed Thumbor and we'd put. Uh, Varnish in front of that, and I don't think we'd put a CD, we hadn't put a CDN in front of it. Um, but as the day sort of, you can see the, this little uh, uptick in the graph, um, and for those at the back, it, it sort of jumped from about 200 requests a second to about 400 very quickly to 600 requests a second. Um, and at the time, Varnish was just kind of like, I think it was using 5% 5, 5 of CPU and just kind of dealing with megabytes of. Uh, static images, um, and it was lovely to watch and see. Um, and then at lunchtime, we sort of started doing a whole bunch of promo activity, and it jumped from the average 600 up to 1,000 requests a second. Um, 
I don't know how many people in this room have had servers run at 1,000 requests a second, but it's, it's quite nice <laughs> um, to watch. Uh, I'm sure it gets more and more impressive, or less impressive when you're at Facebook. Sorry, guys. Um, but yeah, so, so the point is we, we, kind of, we didn't do anything too monumental, and, and we got to this point that we can kind of Black Friday of 2015 was done. Um, it, it wasn't too crazy, and, and we kind of worked through it, and we'd done a few sensible things to pull traffic off of our backends, but nothing, no major crazy architectural changes um, to get there. And we'd rolled in mobile apps. So cool, level clear, 2015 done. Um, and then in the downtime, so, so what Black Friday does to our business is there's kind of this huge prep phase before Black Friday, starting about six months before, and then afterwards you kind of like can't breathe anymore and, and just have a bit of like a relax. Um, but we started playing with, uh, you know, pushing a, a bit more bots into, uh, into Slack, the chat ops concept, um, like Donald Trump was making test great again. Um, yeah, but uh, the point is it, it kind of gives visibility to the company and you can see where things are and, and there's like build servers and so on. So we started playing with that. A lot of this is actually just Jenkins pumping into Slack, but it's very easy to, to put all these things together and, and kind of get a, a good perspective of where everything is. Um, and then another key thing that happened in 2015 as a bigger business, not just the tech team, um, I don't know if everyone's going to be able to read this. So, so we spent quite a lot of time starting to look at, as a company, um, what, we, what we kind of think of as values and, and what values uh, we kind of exemplify a superbalist employee. Um, so I'll read them out just, just for kind of context because uh, some of the stuff uh, depends on it later. Um, it's the idea that we're decisive, so kind of make a decision and, and follow through with it quite quickly. Um, and don't vacillate on things, just make a decision. Um, the, there's the concept of, uh, in the Amazon book, uh, um, Jeff Bezos kind of talks about the idea that, that uh, people have a bias who have a bias for action and who are right quite a lot is very much something we've kind of uh, onboarded. Um, another important one for me is we're in permanent beta. So as a company, everybody understands the concept that uh, things are not uh, perfect and they can always be improved. No process uh, is perfect and it can be kind of examined and gone, hey, that thing needs to change and tweak and, and why are we doing it that way? Um, so there's, there's not like the sacred cow concept of, oh, but that's how that thing works. It's like, well, we can change it and we can make it better. We think big and follow through. So again, think audaciously. We can't, we can't move forward as a business, as a tech team. Um, without kind of going, hey, we want to be big, and we, we're thinking big, and we're we going down that path. Deliver while well through service, so, so be service-oriented. Uh, think about who's asking you a question. Try to help them effectively. Um, we're accountable. You know, you can't go, oh, no, so it's not my problem. Be, be an accountable person. Um, and, and that comes to collaboration. Um, so I know lots of companies are like, we're really collaborative. But I genuinely do think, as a business, we, we have a lot of collaboration. Uh, I feel terrible saying those kind of words. But we, we, we are a business that collaborates. I try within the tech team to make sure that people understand that concept and we break down barriers to going, guys, work together. Everyone must work together because we, we're a better business for it. And we earn each other's trust and keep it simple. So try to always keep it simple and be trustworthy. So this is something that we then that then feeds into hiring processes and and feeds into how people are assessed uh, in quarterly reviews and so on. These values are kind of talked about. Um, so so it makes this this interesting thing that shapes how your culture of the company grows to have these values that I genuinely believe in these things and and I see the the effect of it on the bigger business and within the tech team. Um, so yeah, so you you kind of follow through with that. So onward, on to 2016. Um, so that's what the graph looks like, but actually it looks like that. Um, bigger than we thought. Um, so at this point, uh, I'd kind of uh, hired a bunch of people, and uh, we got a couple of neckbeards in there, but they look like adorable, grumpy um, lions, um, which is pretty true. Um, more developers, some more mobile devs. Uh, the two people with the cool sunglasses are product managers, which, as you know, they wear sunglasses and they're cool. Um, and yeah, so we kind of started uh, 
trying to striate the teams a bit. This doesn't fully show the, the kind of splits in, in responsibilities, but, but started having a first crack at kind of breaking teams up into responsibility areas. Um, and as you can see below, we've replaced our, um, our cactus with magic. Um, which is Google's load balances, and we had a whole bunch of servers now. Um, I think we had about eight or so servers at this point, uh, and um, a couple of big ones, and a couple of small ones, and some workers, and so on. Um, but the point is we could kind of now move our capacity around, and kind of when we had pieces of our system that needed more, we could give it a bit more firepower, and when we needed less, we could have less firepower. So yeah, so kind of growing, still running predominantly off of a MySQL server, a lot of the services. Um, and we started shifting into quite an intolerable phase. Uh, this is part of the experimentation. It's part of being in beta. You probably can't see all these pictures. Uh, basically, we, we started mapping out projects and then kind of mapping which teams would need to be involved in which projects at a kind of high strategic level, um, and trying to map how much capacity those teams had, and get a picture of like whether some project was realistically going to get shipped or not um, in the year, in the quarter, et cetera. Uh, it, was, it was good because as a business, it started giving us diligence about kind of focusing on a prioritized roadmap and getting that behavior kind of going and, and talking about priorities. Um, from a tech team's perspective, it also in some ways was great because people kind of had this target of like, we're trying to ship this many points. Um, and, and I liked some of it, but it also kind of grew some bad behavior, um, which was basically like, well, to hit our KPIs, we need to ship points. Um, and, and for me, that's quite a hard thing because I want engineers in the tech team to focus on what is this for? Why am I doing this? Not I'm solving this problem today, and I have done a number of points this week. Oh, shit. Uh, yeah, so, so trying to get away from this concept of, like, I, I'm, I'm just solving for points, um, but, but we'll talk a bit about it later. So it was useful. It, it gave the, the business a lot more focus, gave everybody a bit of an idea of what the roadmap, what's coming down the line, um, and a bit of sizing kind of uh, concept to it. Um, and, and you can't really see, but we sort of striated into web team, mobile team, site reliability, logistics, new systems, and backend admin. New systems was one guy who also worked on another team, <laughs> um, but generally built new things. Um, and you probably can't see that, it's really great. Uh, but basically, we kind of shifted into this concept of starting to have KPIs within the teams. Uh, and, and in this particular instance, it was uh, the KPIs were uptime, so maintain 99.5% uptime, uh, ship 850 initiative points, um, and net promoter score, which you can look up NPS. Um, it's a thing that we judge ourselves as an entire business, so everybody in the business kind of got NPS. So this is starting to be like this proto idea of how we get KPIs that people are following and kind of working towards, um, but it was kind of crap. Um, but as part of that, we also had, had really good discussions around how much time the team should be spending on things. Because as business starts going, well, why aren't they working on this feature? And you're like, well, there's also this thing of you know, problems that come up and bugs and, and, and. Um, so I kind of came up with this cheese wheel uh, pie chart. And I said, you know, 70% of our time, we should be working on initiatives, because that's moving things forward. 20% of the time. Um, we should be working on just kind of business as usual and ops and problems, and 10% of the time we should be doing innovation. So with, uh, with, the, with that split, it kind of became a bit clearer to, to other parts of the business what, what tech team was actually working on. Um, and uh, it wasn't always perfect, but it kind of, uh, it also it gave me a gap to kind of go, um, we can start doing some innovation in the tech team. Um, and of course, this is uh, Slack Room, which is Tech Brad's graphs, which uh, I regularly get mocked for all the graphs that I draw um, by my team, uh, and they paste them in here. Um, but yeah, so the blue part is people who like pie charts, and the, the orange part is Brad, because I was smack talking pie charts as I put them in. Um, yeah, OK, so I want to talk about that 10%, because uh, that's actually the thing I'm passionate about, um, or I, I think is the most interesting out of this, because moving businesses forward is, is you know, it's whatever. So that 10% kind of manifested itself uh, in what, what 
came to be known as hat day or hack day. Uh, it's kind of used interchangeably. It's just the idea of put another hat on for the day or sort of take your hat off or don't wear a hat. I don't know. It's, it's a hat thing. Um, and, and what that is is every two weeks, basically, so effectively 10% of the development team's time, um, there is a day that's nominated as hack day. And we try to clear space for people to have the opportunity to just work on whatever. Um, I, I've, been, I've always said it's, it's got to be in the company's interest, but I'm kind of very flexible about what's in the company's interest. If you're going to mine crypto, that's not in the company's interest unless you have a business model around it, which there isn't actually one. So yeah, so I, I, I leave the space open for people to kind of uh, do some cool things. Um, and we've, we've, and it's what I call the noise in the system. Uh, so it kind of, we've had some really cool projects come out of it, but there's no expectation that on the first hack day or the second hack day that anybody will do anything of value. Um, it may be you sitting and watching some talks about machine learning or learning about a new Laravel framework or trying something new. So one of the things that's come out of it is the tech on call box, so that just rotates who's on call. We've, we've taken Slack has this uh, concept of a group, and you can add people into a group, and a group can be subscribed to a room. Um, and kind of as a, like an alias, but we are abusing it a little bit. Um, so we pull whoever's in that group out and put the next person in, and it auto-joins them to tech support. Um, but it meant that uh, for something that we'd sort of had a rotation sort of for, we now had this piece of uh, this little tool that basically made people, um, you knew who was on call the next day, and uh, the rest of the business knew who to talk to. They could just address at tech on call, and it was all good. Um, Another one is Superbot. So Superbot basically plugs into Jenkins and tells Jenkins to do deploys. So we're doing chat ops. Um, I'm sure there's other ways of doing it, but this is what came out of our hack day. Um, so when you do a deploy, like all deploys are done through Slack. Um, there's a deploy room. Everyone can see what's going on. So it gives visibility um, and tells you exactly what it's doing while it's deploying and everything. Um, one of the other cool ones which has come out is Smithy. Um, so we forked one of the other work, email workflow things and kind of built our own um, to, to fit in a lot more with how we do things. And now it's becoming a production system, but it started off on a hack day. And it started off with a concept and somebody going, hey, I'm interested in this. I'm going to play around with it. Anyone else interested? OK, cool, da 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 And it may be months. It may be weeks. It may be on the day. The point is that there's this kind of continuous um, uh, these things that just come out of Hack Day, which are cool and interesting, um, and suddenly become things that the business or the tech team relies on quite strongly. Um, and, and I like having that noise, because no one's telling anyone what to do. It's just an interesting thing. Um, the other one is, in our building, there's quite a lot of politics around uh, cutlery. And so <laughs> one Hack Day, uh, a bunch of the tech team went and kind of gathered up cash from people and went to the Chinese store and bought a shitload of spoons and forks and knives and stuff and basically filled all the drawers so there was more forks and knives and spoons than you could ever imagine. It's a really interesting topic. There's a white paper about the, the half-life of cutlery. You're welcome to Google it. It's quite interesting. It's not like a unique problem to South Africa or any given office, but basically you should treat your cutlery as something which has an attrition rate, basically. Um, uh, yeah, so, so part of also what's come out of hack days, uh, and some of this is work work. So on a hack day, if you're working on work, then you call it work work. Um, and part of it has come out of hack days, but the point is we've, we've, I'm quite proud of the fact that we've got 52 public repositories against Superbless, so these are open source software projects. They're projects that, uh, some of them are a bit defunct now for us, but we generally using those projects internally. They've, they're abstraction layers or minor things that we don't need, we, we feel are in the greater good of the, 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 um, the wider open source community because it's helped us so much. Um, so yeah, so, so open source is, is part of the company kind of producing a bit of open source. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but basically I was chatting with Gary, and he's, he's like, this thing works. And I'm like, can you okay it work? And he says, I'll OSNY it later once it's working. Um, open source needs you um, is OSNY. Um, and open source needs all of you. Thank you very much. OK, cool. Um, go and build something cool. OK, great. Um, another hack day project is this t-shirt. Uh, so we kind of didn't have team shirts. and. 
uh, one of the, well, a few people were like, we should really do shirts, should do shirts. Uh, same guy, Gary, was like, okay, cool, I'm going to do it. Um, and we went and got these shirts. This logo uh, on Slack is our, if you colon hero, it's like a little Zelda. And basically, when people do cool things in the team, like you've done something heroic, then you get a colon hero, hero um, or your message gets tabbed hero um, with a reaction. Um, and so, yeah, so we made these shirts. Uh, and that's a hack day. It's the space for people to go, well, uh, I'm going to make shirts for the team. And I'm like, that's really cool. Um, OK, so we kind of, so Hack Day is really cool. And now I'm going to talk a bit about how we, other places that we kind of inject or, or manage our culture within the team and, and some of the things that come out uh, every couple of weeks. I can't remember if it's two or three. I think it's three. Um, we have a collective lunch as a team, um, and it's about an hour and a half long. It's sort of like a retro, but uh, our topics that we put stickies into is uh, things are cuck, um, and that means that they are not going to get any better, and we're just acknowledging that they are shit. Um, this is like third-party providers or payment gateways. Um, or chairs, or the air conditioning, which you're like, it's not ever going to get better, so we just put it up. Um, things that need improvement and are broken, or are broken and need improvement. Uh, things that <clears throat> have improved, so acknowledging that something's gotten better, like because ideally things move from needs improvement to improved. Um, and then victories and actions. So victories are like, hey, we're really proud that we did this thing. Um, and it's a space for people to kind of acknowledge the things that they're proud of or other team members are proud of. Um, and it's quite a nice space. It, it can be quite vigorous. Uh, we had a couple of uh, students who, who are uh, sort of um, graduate programmers in the business, and they came and sat in one particularly vigorous one. And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know if you guys are really going to come look at working for us after you saw that. Um, it was quite, it was a lot of blood on the wall. Um, but what has happened is, so this is one of the things which has come out of Meta. Um, these are labels on pull requests. Uh, so there's includes migration, dangerous, draft, high priority, probably dangerous, and tiny. Um, so that was one of the things that kind of came out of Meta, of going, hey, we need this way that we can kind of identify what where the pull requests are little ones. So, you, you know, because getting everybody to, so our process internally is that, pull requests have to be reviewed, um, and they have to get at least one big thumb on them. Um, so that's sort of a senior or someone nominated as a big thumb. And, um, and so knowing that something is a tiny pull request makes it a lot easier to kind of filter through and just go, oh, that's a tiny, OK, cool, it's three line change, whatever, it's easy. Um, probably dangerous is useful for those ones where we're like, we think it might be fine, but it might not be. Because um, I'd rather deploy things than worry about um, them being dangerous. And, and as we go down the path, we get a, a lot, lately it's a lot easier for us to kind of roll back code if we do have something problematic that goes into production. Um, another thing is branch protection. So we kind of, everybody agreed at some point, okay, <laughs> um, that, we, that we need protection on master. So how, how you merge into master and, um, and kind of uh, actually prevent uh, things without reviews going into master. Um, pull request templates are really useful as well, so um, use them. Um, we basically f enforce having a GIF almost in every one. Um, big thumbs, which I talked about, so nominated people who can sign off on pull requests. Um, we bumped up against some of the limits, like you can't have more than 20 reaction emojis on a message in Slack. So I don't know what those jokers are doing. Um, and we shifted into having quite a plethora of services. Um, so this is Jenkins builds, uh, and it just gets bigger and bigger every week. Um, and quite a complicated architecture. Um, so there's more and more services in our architecture. That's how we deal with uh, bigger and bigger traffic. Um, and, if, and last year, uh, William talked about Kubernetes and how it's helped us manage this stuff. Um, for those of you who don't know, and we talked about Kubernetes earlier, um, blah, 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 or in my world, I love Kubernetes. Um, it's been one of the things that has shifted the teams being able to manage their own infrastructure and having a very predictable way that we, we do service deployments, uh, rollouts, uh, et cetera. Um, and 
Kubernetes is, is in the realm of 12factor.net. Who knows about 12factor.net? Okay. All of you who don't, please go read it. Um, if you're doing app deployment of any kind, this is pretty much the Bible on how you should be building apps and how you should be deploying them. Um, and you don't have to do everything, but it's useful to be conscious of it. Um, but yeah, so use other people's stuff um, is a huge thing for me, and it's, it's how we've gotten through Black Fridays repeatedly. It's because you know, we, we needed a better CMS, so we rolled out uh, Wagtail, which is a third-party CMS built on Django, and we can put an API in front of it. It'll be great, because suddenly at midnight it'll fuck out and you'll have lots of latency. But we solved the problem really quickly and then came back and fixed these things. But, but the point was, on the whole, it was pretty good and then it was shit and then it was good again. Um, Elasticsearch going wonky and a graph climbing up and you suddenly realize that it's been going like that for quite a while. Um, so Black Friday, uh, these were just performance optimizations. So 2016 was kind of uneventful a bit. We, we didn't have too much going on. It, it actually was a very, uh, well, we were pretty well prepared for the day. There were some fuck ups earlier on in the week, but um, on the whole, uh, what it did spawn is having better monitoring push into Slack as well. And we started bumping up into real world problems, which is payments might be broken, um, which is, thanks for them, um, is Third parties are starting to fail us more than we fail, um, which is kind of a real problem in, in the world. Uh, and so we're getting better at managing our third party suppliers, um, but ultimately bank serve and credit card providers are the things that screw us on Black Friday more than anything now. Um, um, yeah, uh, Prometheus as well has been very useful for anyone who doesn't know Prometheus. Once you get into Kubernetes and Prometheus, the, the two work very well together. Uh, okay, 2017, sorry, I'm running out of time. I'm really cuck. I'm bad at estimates, I'm a developer. Okay, cool. Um, okay, but here's the kind of crux here, is 2017 we shifted into giving people a mission, um, which meant following Spotify's agile models for teams. Um, which basically, like, this grid is a whole bunch of responsibilities and shit. Ah, it's time, shit. Okay. Um, okay, that's one of the biggest things that's been helpful for 2017 is each of these teams has a focus area um, that has KPIs that are related to customer experience things. Um, and it's meant that the teams kind of have ownership and they take responsibility and they have a mission. Um, and that, that for me has been the biggest thing for how we as a team and as a business have grown and kind of survived Black Friday and doesn't intimidate me as we move forward because with the ownership, people kind of can, can take control of things and, and be proud in what they work on. Um, and that's actually the thing that leads to the best outcomes. Okay, I'm just gonna do, 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 Those all the things. Uh, if anyone wants to come see all the rest of the slides. Okay, yeah, so last, last point, last point, okay? Point of order. Okay, teams rise to their mission. In times of crisis, everyone knows what they need to worry about, so this year by far, as shit fucked out, I didn't have to be involved in a lot of things because people just kind of knew what they needed to take care of. And project prioritization is easier, um, which yields these cool things. Yaxi, there's a 1.5 million calls per minute on MySQL, that wasn't great. Lots of servers, okay, cool. Okay, wait, wait, there we go. Use other people's stuff, give people a mission and empowerment, and keep a bit of noise in the system. Cool. That's me. Do, do we have time for questions, or am I over budget? Funnily enough, we don't. Hey? Um, let's give you two questions, but two you're questions. way over time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm not good at budgets, I'm a tech guy. Small quick question. Can you please fix my icon? Which icon? 
Uh, there's lots of smiley faces. Uh. <laughs> and I'd like to be a maggot icon, please. Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry, Berlin. Two, two real questions. <laughs> Um, as you scaled from one team to multiple, what were the biggest challenges you found in trying to draw boundaries and yet still keep inter-team communications? Um, yeah, it was complicated because in the early days it still was sort of everyone does everything themselves and I tried to start drawing boundaries and I tried to find naturalish boundaries for, for people, um, but it was challenging. It, it just was an awkward time um, and I think we, we enter this phase now of, of having these teams and, and growing them is actually quite straightforward. Uh, there's still awkward times. There's places where we sort of have bleeds and responsibilities between teams, but we're slowly working that out as well. Um, but it, I think it's always awkward. There's, there's always those things where you're like, this isn't that team's and that's not that team, so you just have to make a decision. So I think to, to answer your question, it's just actually about making a decision about something and going, it may not make sense, but it you're going to do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, as, as part of your optimization process, um, I know that a lot of people like to focus on application optimization. What was your approach to database optimization? Um, so, again, that comes to New Relic, uh, which is over here. Um, so... New Relic gives really deep insights. Uh, who's used New Relic? Just, yeah. Um, it, it gives you nice things where you can just kind of abstractly go and look at what the worst performing things are or the things with the most downstream calls in and just focus on those things. So, so there's not necessarily a particular methodology. It's just going, well, that call gets called quite a lot and it doesn't run very fast, so we need to make it faster. Um, and in doing that, uh, sometimes that's layering on cache, or sometimes it's because somebody wanted some random key and is now doing a kind of a, a whole series of queries on something and then bubbling it up to something else. So it's mostly just shaking things out and finding where we where dumb stuff has happened. Um, by far and above, as much as we we kind of scraped through this year's Black Friday, um, but the thing that I came away with was. Our system fundamentally can, can handle the load. There's just a whole bunch of places where we're doing a whole bunch of read queries that are really silly and don't actually, they, they shouldn't exist. Um, so we're getting better at that, and part of that's re-architecting some of these things. Um, and I was going to talk about, but they said I don't have enough time, um, <laughs> is shifting to event-oriented architecture. And in that world, you can start making your front ends just kind of listen for events rather than ending up talking to a database. And my goal for databases is you should almost never read from a database, and you should only write to a database when you absolutely have to. Um, and it's important data, et cetera. So yeah. OK. Thanks, Tom. Cool.